Hello and welcome once again to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Camp Myers. We are here today to discuss politics and the November 7th elections that surprised a lot of people, including me, on, on the way things turned out. Well, uh, I'm always surprised because well, however I predict it comes out, it never does. <laughs> but yeah, we've entitled this show, Wow, uh, Look What Happened. Uh, and we're going to have the person back who told us what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Now, we didn't create a scorecard to check uh, Mike McCarville's predictions versus how it turned out, but he'll have a chance to talk to us about that. He will have his own uh, take on uh, what went on and uh, uh, discuss such things as coattails, I suspect, and uh, other political terms that I don't understand, but you probably do. But he's always entertaining, and he'll have uh, a lot of good information for us. A number of statewide races were on the ballot this year, some state questions, and of course, uh, Governor Henry re-elected for four more years. We'll get Mike McCarville's take on all of that and what really happened during the election on November 7th. It's coming up on The Verdict. Chesapeake Energy, here's a few of our favorite hornets. Alexis likes reading. Sam enjoys history. Alec loves math. Chesapeake is proud to support both the Oklahoma City NBA Hornets and the Young Hornets at Horace Mann Elementary, where over 150 Chesapeake employees mentor to children each week. The students gain a lot from the experience, but not as much as we do. Chesapeake Energy, committed to building a better Oklahoma. save with Cox Digital Telephone? Well, my bill came and... Could this be right? You may be surprised how much you save with Cox Digital Telephone. That's why over a million and a half people have switched. So this really is a total. Lovely. Because I think I found a good use for the savings. With Cox, there's no waiting for the other shoe to drop. The only surprise is there's no surprise at all. One in four women will be a victim of domestic or sexual violence in their lifetime. That's too many. That's why we want you to know that if you or someone you know is suffering at the hands of an abuser, there is help. Call the Oklahoma Safe Line at 1-800-522-SAFE for access to state and local resources that can truly make a difference. Call anonymously, call toll free, call today because domestic violence is not a game. It's, it's life, life or, or death. death. Welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett, Kent Myers, and Kent's going to introduce today's guest. One of, if not our favorite guest on The Verdict, is back with us for his eighth appearance on The Verdict. Uh, we're just going to have to start putting him there full time and just have you on all the time, Mike. Mike McCarville, uh, the producer of The McCarville Report Online, former talk show host and program director at KTOK, former Capitol correspondent, a uh, political pundit and a fellow who knows what's going on in Oklahoma as well as nationally. We're going to talk about, wow, look what happened. Welcome mm -hmm. back. Well, thank you. Eight times. Eight, Eight times, times you've been on this show. Just shows how short you gentlemen are on good guests. <laughs> 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 Just kidding, of course. Right before Just we went kidding. on, you brought up a good point. Four years ago, Brad Henry got 43%. Correct. This time, a landslide. Governor landslide. What's happened? Uh, well, make no mistakes. When Governor Brad Henry became the governor four years ago, uh, he and his staff consciously adopted this motto or this, this uh, rule to go by, make no mistakes. Mm -hmm. In other words, don't mess up what you've got going. Are they following uh, a political model that's worked somewhere else? Not or? to my knowledge, yeah. but they're following a model okay, and it may be uh, Brad Henry's alone, but it certainly mm -hmm. worked for him, obviously. And you know, there, there have been a lot of raps on the governor in the last four years, Governor Late was his nickname for a while because he's late everywhere he goes. Uh, and uh, I was uh, joking with his uh, chief of staff uh, the day after the election. I said, I've got a new nickname for the governor. Oh, what is it? And I said, uh, Governor Late Landslide. 
but I've dropped the lake. I think Governor Landslide fits, doesn't it? Yeah. 74 of 77 counties. Mm -hmm. A huge, huge win over Congressman Ernest Isten. Let's talk about the lieutenant governor's race. Yes. Uh, Jerry Askins uh, beat Todd Hyatt. Uh, yep. Uh, fairly handily, I guess. But, yes. Uh, what do yes. You, well, what's your take is, on that? A win is a win. That's handy. And handily yeah. works. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think uh, in the case of uh, Jerry Askins, uh, uh, Kent, that uh, coattails did extend from Governor Henry down to that office, and wasn't that a kind of an odd campaign where the Republican Speaker of the House, who aspired to be Lieutenant Governor, was kind of trying to grab the governor's coattails as well, uh, running ads, you know, talking about or television commercials talking about how closely he'd worked with him on the budget compromise in particular, and then <clears throat> at one point uh, literally refusing to say that he was going to vote for his own party's nominee for governor, Ernest Iztook, obviously again trying to align himself with the governor. And uh, yeah, that race was not a surprise to me. It turned out just about how I thought it would. Mm -hmm. I figured out about 10 days before the election that unless the, 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 the Askins the campaign that came off the tracks, she probably was going to win, and that's exactly the way it turned Look, out. Looking back, though, Mike, the primaries, both of them had yes. contested primaries, oh, yes. did, mm -hmm. and both of them had to spend significant money to they get did. into to November. How did all that p play out, do you think? I think, uh, I, I, I think it frankly, turned out to be kind of a wash. I think it did help uh, Todd Hyatt increase his name ID. Unfortunately, he spent a lot of money, uh, spent a lot of money in the primaries that he then had to, that he then had to really move into almost total fundraising mode. And in the case of Jerry Askins, being a wealthy lady, uh, she simply uh, wrote a check to her campaign. She put in, what, $880,000 uh, into her own campaign. Uh, and that's a, when, you, when you have those kinds of financial resources in a campaign, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a huge advantage, obviously. And what that means is uh, you can take your campaign plan, you can book your TV time, your radio time, your newspaper ads, all everything, direct mail, telephone, everything that goes into a campaign, uh, with the assurance that it's paid for. Mm -hmm. And if you're Todd Hyatt or any other candidate on the other hand, uh, if you don't have the financial resources on hand, then you've kind of got to tiptoe through the tulip, so to speak. And you cannot make those firm decisions early enough to really have your game plan uh, implemented and roll right up to election day. What about the uh, state treasurer's office? Uh, no, no, surpri race. no, no surprise to me. I, I uh, anticipated uh, Scott Meacham uh, would win that race. Uh, as it turned out, it really wasn't all that close. Uh, and I think uh, that's probably about what I expected in that one. The labor commissioner. Uh, that one uh, was uh, a, maybe the biggest surprise of yeah, the Yeah, it was certainly races. a surprise to me. Yeah, uh, Brenda Renault uh, being defeated by Lloyd Fields. Uh, I frankly thought Renault was going to pull that one out. Now, in retrospect, uh, I think a mistake, if we can call it that, Lloyd Fields was up on television the last 72 hours, uh, heavy schedule, about 100,000 into the, the TV buy alone. Brenda Renault, I don't believe, had a single television commercial. She concentrated her limited resources on uh, radio and uh, print. Uh, the uh, Fields campaign was fueled in the, in the last uh, week, 10 days, by immense sums from organized labor, $5,000 at a whack. I know one of his uh, CR4s, one of his late Ethics Commission filings I looked at, uh, $35,000, seven $5,000 donations from organized labor entities. So uh, they clearly uh, fueled his campaign and it uh, worked for him. Well, we had them on this show and they went after each other pretty hard. They did the same yes, thing did. in the campaign, I guess, yes. generally. Yep, that they did. Um, Let's take a look or talk about the state auditor and inspector's race. Again, uh, that I thought Gary Jones, the Republican nominee, was going to be able to pull that one out. didn't turn out that way. Uh, Jeff McMahon, the uh, incumbent, was able to stave him off. And, of course, this is another one of those, like the labor commissioner race, was a repeat of four years ago. And uh, in this case, uh, Fields, who lost four years ago, was able to upset uh, Renault. Uh, that, uh, again, is one of those things. Uh, who knows what uh, what went on there? Uh, but there was uh, sure a lot of action. Uh, again, uh, organized labor playing a, a big role in that race. You know, the, these campaigns, the statewide campaigns, many of them lasted a year. Oh, absolutely. And, 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 and they are frequently micromanaged. And you talk about this week and this week, and you talk about uh, trends and mistakes that may have been made. But at the end of the day, it just seemed to matter mostly if there was an R or a D by your name. I mean, that seemed to be the biggest factor in the race, despite all of the other factors that go into running a year-long political campaign. You know, you know, I've, I've been asked many times, Mick, and a matter of fact, we've already discussed it uh, off camera. 
uh, whether there were these coattails of the governors extended down, you know, much down into the secondary offices. I think in, in, specifically, no. Generally, yes. Because I think it did, Democrats this time around, it seems to me, had a little bit more spirit than Republicans. And that is to say, particularly in the outlying areas of the state, they were more inclined to go vote and stamp the rooster. Uh, whereas in the past, they might have been a little more inclined to pick and choose. So I think in that sense, mm -hmm. uh, it did help uh, Democrats on the ticket. Now, did that extend down into the legislative races? Not at all, in my opinion. And I think you yeah. need look no further than the well, fact that Republicans picked up a couple of senators. Did it seem to you like that voters did actually distinguish a connection between the lieutenant governor's position and the governor's position, and they were actually looking for a lieutenant governor that could get along with Brad Henry? I'm not sure they were that sophisticated in their thinking. Uh, I, I think, uh, I mean, you know, uh, in, in years past, I know a lot of re my Republican friends have said, well, I'm going to vote for the Republican nominee for governor. I might as well vote for the Republican nominee for lieutenant governor. And I think that was kind of the, kind of what we may have seen this time around, just the association, DD. Well, Jerry Eskins was able to invent herself on television. I don't think Absolutely. a lot of people knew who she was. And yep. uh, there had already been, uh, you know, uh, uh, 12 years of having a woman in that role. So I think she benefited from that, too. Yes. Uh, but still, the, 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 the distance that she was able to separate herself from Todd Hyatt. And Todd had a lot of money, too. You, you mentioned that, yes. that, that mm -hmm. she put in a lot of her own money. But Todd, if you look back a year ago, how much money he had, he looked like the candidate that was, that was the 200-pound gorilla. No, I, I agree with you. And I, I think, again, that's one of those campaigns, I think, in the closing um, 72 hours of the campaign, mm -hmm. I just had this this gut feeling that Askins was starting to pull away, mm -hmm. and I think that's exactly what. I think happened. people became comfortable with her. I, I, and, I would and agree with that. At a, at yes. a time when they were trying to make a decision. Well said. Mike McCarvel's our guest on the verdict. We'll be right back. Stay with us. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record, since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. Shining is taking responsibility. At Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Oklahoma, we know managing your health care can be overwhelming, and it's our job to help you meet the challenge. By guiding, supporting, and showing the way, we encourage you to gain control. Because we believe the best tool we can give you is the confidence to take charge. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Oklahoma, shining through. Okiwani is an Indian name for a place where children play. When we obtained the camp, we found a lot of oil debris left in the woods. We saw a commercial about how the oil and natural gas industry cleans up old oil well sites. We called the OERB and they agreed to remove tons of concrete and steel didn't cost us a thing. Thousands of children have left their footprints on this land. Thanks to the oil and gas industry, they will for a long time to come. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all the quality, assistance, and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 2-3 child. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. Cox Communications and the Oklahoma Historical Society present the first in a new series of programs created especially for Oklahoma Centennial. You cannot understand Oklahoma history without understanding the history of the American Indians. They decided to preserve Sequoia's last home. His home has never been moved. It's on the exact spot he built it in 1829. Voices of Oklahoma, the American Indian experience. See it all this month on the Cox Channel. Hello, anybody home? Hi. Digital Max, welcome to the neighborhood. Hello, kid. Whoa, I haven't seen a digital tangle like that since... Yeah. You need Cox Connections. With one connection, you get the whole digital enchilada. Kind of like this. Wow. What are you waiting for? Get one connection to all your digital services from Cox. I think I pulled something. Your friend in the digital age.
Welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett, Kent Myers, our guest is Mike McCarville. And uh, the Oklahoma Senate races uh, turned out to move to the right. However, you know, for two years or four years, we've been hearing how this was the year that the Republicans took control of the Senate outright, and that did not happen. Came very close. Uh, literally, uh, a switch of uh, 173 votes in a race out in southwestern Oklahoma between uh, Ivester and Russ would have given Republicans control. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I got to say that the 24-24 that tie with Democrats in control with the election of Askins came out exactly <laughs> as I predicted it would. Uh, I just I had this sense. I, I didn't think Republicans could get completely over the hump, but you, you consider that there were six races in which uh, Democrats, uh, at least in some of them, clearly were at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. uh, you just had to believe that Republicans were going to pick up a couple of them. Right. Uh, to give them the 24-24 well, tie. Don't forget, though, six months ago, Nancy Riley switched parties. Senator Absolutely. Riley from uh, yes. Sand Springs area. That's correct. She switched from the Democratic yes. Party to the Republican, or uh, vice versa, from the yeah. Republican Party to the Democratic Democrat Party. Party. Mm -hmm. And oh, what a difference that makes today. Oh, yeah, certainly does. Oh, yeah. Well, if that had not happened, of course, obviously, uh, Republicans would be in control. Now, the big question to me and the fascinating political story of 2007, in my humble opinion, is going to be how the Senate organizes itself beginning in January. Mm -hmm. Now keep in mind, when the Senate first meets to reorganize itself, 24 repubs, 24 dems, guess who the tiebreaker is the first time they meet? That would be Congresswoman-elect. That would be Congresswoman-elect Mary, Mary Fallon, <laughs> who is still the uh, president of the Senate. Yeah. Because Jerry Askins isn't sworn in until, what, a week or 10 days later. Yeah. So it is going to be, I suspect there's going to be a whole lot of jockeying going on. And any decision that can be forestalled will be forestalled. Well, election of the uh, uh, president pro tem of the Senate. Uh, how's that going to? Well, I mean, that, 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 obviously that's the big question. I mean, yeah. what do they do? Does Morgan stay? Does Mike Morgan uh, from Stillwater remain as president of the Senate? Uh, and uh, Glenn Coffey, now the Senate Minority Leader. I mean, did he, mm -hmm. does he become chair of the Appropriations and Budget Committee? Oh, how how exactly yeah. uh, does it work out? Someone suggested, well. You're going to have dual uh, uh, president pro tems in the Senate. And I said, no, nah, that's never going to work. You know, that'd be a disaster. Even though Coffee laughingly went into uh, uh, Morgan's office the morning after the election and put a piece of tape right down the middle of it yeah. and said, you get this and I get that. He was a good sport about it. Yeah, absolutely he was. Now, yeah, we're, we're going to have him on here in a week or so. We'll yeah. ask him about but that. But it seems like there's going to be increased awareness of attendance in the state Senate. I mean, if someone's not Listen, there on a vote or the, if the lieutenant governor travels, which the, is typically the The first the Republican the or the first governor. Democrat that is ill on a, on a significant <laughs> vote day is in deep trouble. I'll tell you that. And you're right. What does the lieutenant governor, who ordinarily is out and about the state quite a bit, uh, pumping tourism, working with the film commission, those kind of things. Yeah. How hamstringed does uh, the lieutenant governor become in having to stick close to home? Becomes a homebound, it seems to exactly. me. Exactly. Uh, of all the elections, local, state, national, that you looked at uh, this recent election, what surprised you the most? West Lane, David Prater. No doubt about it. I think it's the biggest surprise to most people. I did an online poll on my website. And that was the choice of almost 50 percent with a whole bunch of uh, choices mm -hmm. there. And for our Tulsa audience, that's the Oklahoma County District that, Attorney. That is, that is correct. Uh, West Lane, of course, the, the incumbent was reelected fairly easily uh, four years ago over uh, Mickey Holmesy. Mm -hmm. uh, this time around, faced in a former assistant uh, DA, David Prater, whom he had uh, fired from the office, uh, literally. Uh, and uh, that race, I felt uh, two weeks out that West Lane was going to win easily. I did sense it had closed in the final week. And I think what happened, again, that's one of those races, I think, that uh, the decisions were made by a lot of voters in, in literally in that race in the final 36 hours. I think uh, West Lane probably experienced almost everything bad that can happen to a campaign, campaign a candidate in the closing week of a campaign. He had an assistant uh, that was erected, uh, arrested for uh, driving under the influence of drugs that received quite a bit of publicity. That was on like Friday. Uh, and then over the weekend, we saw an interview with, a, with a, the, uh, a family member of a crime victim who had appeared in one of West Lane's commercials, praising him for his action. She's sitting with David Prater saying, oh, I was misled by an assistant. I'm now with this guy. And all of this just creates this uh, mm -hmm. uh, turmoil in, in, in the minds of voters. And keep in mind, this is a race where uh, almost 170,000 votes were cast. David Prater won by 824 mm -hmm. votes. 
And no question, having an R or a D by your name was much more significant than 800 votes. Uh, probably. Yes, probably so. Nationally, a lot of talk from people I talked to in Dallas about how they had a bunch of judges that got bounced out because they had an R by their name. Yes. And we had some judges knocked down. Not that our judges' elections are partisan, mm -hmm. but we had some judges. Like, any, any thoughts there? Why, why were people bouncing judges more frequently this well, time? Well, yeah, at the district court level in, in, in Oklahoma County, mm -hmm. uh, yes. all but two lost mm -hmm. and only two retained their seats I, and, and I don't like know maybe five guys, or six may, lost. maybe voters are saying hey it's time for a change well they maybe, don't know the judges well but again it's it's just that there's this sense yeah that, that that something's not right and by golly we just need to make some changes mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know you can look at all these uh, races what happened around the country in judicial races or, or local legislative races and so many times this is what you see there, there are no uh, obvious reason for a judge to be to be bounced in some of these cases, yeah. uh, but they were. And uh, no, the judges that were bounced had great uh, uh, records, polls, mm -hmm. records mm -hmm. from the mm -hmm. county bar. They hadn't been in trouble with the law or otherwise. Uh, they weren't getting criticism, and an unknown came along and just beat them. And nobody can explain why. Yeah. The national, the U.S. Senate, yes. had switched. That was a surprise. I, the I, House I was switched. surprised by that. Most people were not surprised that the House switched, but just I, it was I, just a landslide of, of Democratic Yes, activity. I anticipated uh, Democrats would take control of the House, not by the number of seats they did. I thought it would be about half that, but I thought they'd get enough to take control. I was surprised uh, by the, uh, the strength they showed in taking control of the Senate. And uh, the key race, uh, in my mind, uh, was in Virginia where uh, uh, Jim Webb uh, beat the incumbent uh, senator. Uh, and I think in that race in particular, that may have been a manifestation of the, the, the beating the incumbent uh, took from uh, the national media, the Washington Post in particular, which was uh, on him for the last 90 days of the campaign almost every day in a very negative fashion. Uh, and uh, it, that, that's one of those, that, again, went down to the, what it was a day and a half later before, <laughs> before, yeah. before we really knew what the outcome was yeah. going to be. So it was just, it was close, close, close. Hmm. Um, I've heard a couple of theories, really spin. Um, one Republican spin master was saying in the state of Oklahoma that they felt it really wasn't R&D as much as it was. This was just a governor that had everything going for them and it filtered down and it was really a Brad Henry election and not a Democratic election. Your take on that? I, I, in a lot of ways, uh, Mick, I would concur with that thought. I uh, have said uh, that uh, I think finally, after a lot of years, David Boren has been supplanted as the 800-pound gorilla in Oklahoma electoral politics, uh, and uh, the guy who re supplanted him is now sitting in the governor's office for another four years. His name is Brad Henry. Uh, you consider, four years ago, Brad Henry was elected 43% of the vote in a three-way race. This time around, what was the final percentage? 66? I mean, it's just the astronomical numbers. Carried 74 of the state's 77 counties. Uh, beat Congressman Ernest Iztuk soundly in, in, in his own congressional district in Oklahoma County. Uh, took his head off in Tulsa County and everywhere else, as it turns out. Uh, so, I mean, it's just clear that there's a, there has got to be an overriding reason for a candidate like Brad Henry to get that kind of widespread support, and the answer to me is people just like him. The same thing David Bourne had going for him. And we will make that the final word on this show. Mike McCarville, thanks as always. My for coming pleasure, over. gentlemen. Thanks Thank for you. coming. Kent and I'll have a final word when we get back. Good life comes naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. 
Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First. Loyal to Oklahoma. Loyal to you. Here at the Cox Channel, we want to thank all the players, cheerleaders, coaches, and fans for another great season of high school football. But we're not done yet. The Built for Tough Playoff Connection is providing some bold moves with scores from across the state, coaches' interviews, and bracketology. Get connected to the playoffs with the Built for Tough Playoff Connection on the Cox Channel. We're all about the playoffs. Just keep it. Thank you. Dr. Kessler? What's up with the pizzas? Well, I just got my first satellite bill, and those extra fees were a bit of a shocker. So I had to take a second job. Hey, this was supposed to be pepperoni, Dillweed. Hey, it's Dr. Dillweed to you. Whatever. Kids. <laughs> it's cool, eh? You know, I'm a people person. Don't live in satellite denial. Get all your entertainment without the hidden charges from Cox, your friend in the digital age. If the Richter scale has settled down, Mike McCarville has left the building. Well, I, yeah, I think he's gone, <laughs> but but I hope he'll come back. <laughs> he is just terrific. Yes, he is. And uh, he obviously keeps track of these things, knows what uh, is going on in these election and elections, follows them, follows the candidates, and uh, he'll he'll be back soon to talk mm -hmm. about uh, some other things like this. And it'll be uh, unfolding as uh, our Congress and the and the state uh, Senate and the state House get together. It's uh, it's going to be a new day in Oklahoma. It'll be interesting. It will be fascinating. <clears throat> and uh, speaking of fascinating, our next show is going to be talking about uh, presidential signing statements with two experts on them to talk about what they are and how they're used. Be an interesting show. We will be back next week with another show. For Kent Myers, I'm Mick Cornett. Thank you for joining us on this edition of The Verdict. And check out our website and give us a topic you'd like to see us discuss. The preceding program was produced by the Production Services Group at Cox Communications, exclusively for the Cox Channel.